welcome to Cowboys from the Couch by Life Stands Health. I'm Nikki Lianza, and on today's episode, I'll be talking with Dr. Vicki Bellina, our National DEI Director, about mental health in South Asian cultures. So welcome, Dr. Bellina. Thank, thank you. you so thank you. Thank you. Well, my name is Vicki Bellina, and I am a clinical psychologist, and I work out of the Vernon Hills uh, Life Stance Health Office. It's in a suburb of Chicago. Um, so I've been in private practice for about 10 years or so, and I also teach uh, undergrads and graduate level psychology classes. So in my previous clinical experience, I've worked in hospitals and school systems and even within the prison system. But obviously the last 10 years or so, I've been in private practice. So something I've seen is an increase in seeing South Asian individuals coming into clinical um, practice and coming in for services. And so that's kind of what I'm here to talk about a little today. So. Yeah. Which is, I think, so important that we are talking about this. Now, when we look at South Asian cultures, what specific regions are we we covering here? So I personally identify as a South Asian female. And so um, so Asia in general um, comes with five regions. So I'm going to be talking about South Asia specifically. So which that would cover the countries of India, uh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Bangladesh. So we could spend like the entire podcast just talking about the makeup of Asia, but obviously this is not a geography podcast, right? So I think it's going to uh, be important to note just the differences though, right? So there's also 48 countries that make up Asia and there's about a hundred languages. Wow. And so I think that is important to note that when we are asked to check off the race box in um, the categories, right, when it, whenever we're filling out applications, whatever it is, that's important to note that whether I'm from China, right, and I speak Mandarin, or whether I'm from India and I speak Hindi, or whether I'm from Cambodia and speak Vietnamese, we're all going to check off that Asian box. So that is extremely important to yeah. note here. So. No, good Good to know that and help us understand that for sure. Yeah. So I will be talking about um, a specific uh, part, right? So South Asian. And then in general, that country that I'm talking about will be India, as that is where I'm from. And generations before me, all my family is from there. Gotcha. So, um, and then within India, <laughs> I'm going to be talking specifically about Punjab, which is a state in India. So again, like we have Asia and then we I, have South Asia and then, you know, we're just getting more and more specific. More so. Got you. Yeah, no, that's great. I appreciate that. So let me, let us start our conversation. Can you give us an idea of what are some of the paramount values within South Asian culture? So, you know, again, just backing up just for a second, right? Um, it goes back to India does have the world's oldest cultures, right? And so there's many languages that are spoken in India. So, and within the world too, and within the US. And so religious wise as well, there's many religions that people will follow. So some people will identify as Hindu, some will identify as Muslim, Catholic, Christian, Sikh, Buddhist. And so personally, again, my family is from Punjab and my religious identity is Sikh. And so, again, I'm just going to be talking about like a specific part. And this is just generalizing. Yeah. So okay. I think um, across the board in all Asian and South Asian families, family for sure is fundamental. And so when I'm talking about family, I'm not just saying like a mom, dad, like two and a half kids and their dog. I'm talking about like sets of grandparents, great grandparents, uncles, aunties, cousins, in-laws, like extremely close. And so I think for sure that's important to remember that family truly is the glue that I think holds South Asian families together. So the, the institutions of marriage and children are paramount in South Asian families. And so I think, um, I'm sure you've heard of like big Indian weddings. <laughs> so I'm here to tell you that's completely true. <laughs> so like 200 members in a family in going to a wedding is going to be a small wedding for us. Wow, <laughs> so it's completely that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so weddings are celebrate like big celebrations, again, family, friends, everyone. And so it does go back to show that marriage and children are, again, fabrics inside every single South Asian family. And so 
arranged marriages as well are very popular in South Asian families. And so that is something that, you know, just to be aware of as that's not very common in Western right. cultures, right? And so, you know, I know over the years, for sure, it's acceptable to bring home a date. Now, you might be introducing them to like 25 of your closest family members, <laughs> so a little pressure there. But I think those kinds of differences are extremely important to note, right? So... Yeah. And then also, in addition, I think, you know, things like hard work and making it and academics are definitely values that are stressed on from a very early on age. Okay. So it's not it's very common to have at least one college degree. So I think those are certain differences that a lot of clinicians, a lot of people would not know if they're having a South Asian come into the um, come in for services to be like, oh, okay, so maybe you had an arranged marriage. That's not going to be common, le- like common knowledge that we're going to ask people those kinds of things. Cause here we assume right. that, you know, most people dated and things right. like that. So. Right. so bringing mental health into this conversation, how may mental health symptoms present in the culture? So again, like, I think there's a lot of different ways that they can present. Um, So Western cultures in general, right, are very independent. And, you know, Asian cultures, um, Eastern cultures are very interdependent. So I think, you know, for Western cultures, it's important to know that we encourage individuality. We ask people to speak up, right? Talk about their emotions, discuss their wants versus Eastern cultures where we're talking more about the collective whole family. And so that respect of elders and having their permission to do certain things, that's going to be definitely a different that it will be important to note. And so also with that goes hand in hand, like the way we express emotions. So I think in Western cultures, we're more likely to express our emotions more openly. And in Eastern cultures, it's going to be more subtle. Now, the one note to difference, though, is that uh, physical symptoms are okay to discuss. (laughs) Okay. So, for example, you know, it's going to be more likely that you have a South Asian person presenting with headaches and stomach aches okay. and somatic like symptoms. And therefore, they will most likely present at a primary care physician's office versus identifying an emotion of sadness or depression and going to go see a psychologist. So I think um, that definitely is also something to, you know, open. So I think, you know, the openness of mental health and seeing visibility of South Asian therapists and mental health professionals has definitely helped change some of this conversation. You know, I know personally growing up, there was no talk of mental health in, in my home. And but over the years, you know, at at the dinner table, like my mom, for example, will be like, hey, you know, how's everyone's self-care? How's everyone doing? Is everyone taking care of themselves? You know, so definitely I think myself being in the mental health field has brought about these dinner conversations to be very normal. And so I think it is very important for mental health professionals who are of South Asian descent to be vocal and to be seen in the community so that we can actually have some of these conversations and make them more doable, you know, so. Got you, got you. And and I I do have, so I identify as Italian American. And so I do have some clients that, who align with South Asian culture. And, and some of these, some of my clients are of the younger age, so they might still be living with their parents Mm -hmm. or still have a lot of connection with their parents, even if they're away at college or something. And so sometimes my discussions with them are are looking at, you know, the differences with American culture, U.S. Mm -hmm. culture, and and maybe the culture of uh, my client's parents and how sometimes Mm -hmm. they can kind of maybe butt heads against each other. So I... You know, I think you sharing with us some of the, these cultural considerations, if you're a therapist and what to expect, but are there other tips you would give therapists who are not of South Asian culture in, in understanding and knowing working with clients who are South Asian or, or maybe uh, children or a generation mm-hmm. from uh, South Asian parents? So I think, you know, again, it goes back to like this Western Eastern kind of um, difference, right? So like things like creativity, those are not going to be values, again, in general, I'm speaking, that are going to be pushed in South Asian households. You know, so if you have someone presenting who, you know, wants to do something extremely creative, that might not be something that Ah. is being pushed at home. And so, 
to be aware of those things. Yeah. And like, it's that balance of, okay, so how do I teach you how to advocate for yourself, but to be sensitive that I don't alienate the family and that respect of the elders. Cause again, it goes back to that connectiveness is paramount yeah. in South yeah. Asian families. So it definitely is that, um, is that balance, right. And trying to see that there are other other differences and other things in a lot of South Asian households, um, such as, you know, religion and religious rituals and things like that. And so, you know, in a clinical setting, those might not be the first several questions that we ask, right? We're not going to ask about, oh, hey, how's your great grandma doing? (laughs) You know, those are not common things like, hey, have you been going to, you know, church, temple, the Gurdwara, a mandar, all those things are things that you might not be asking. And so I think in a clinical, um, the first couple of sessions, I think those are going to be important to address with patients to really get a feel of, you know, who is, who is a part of their family? What are the values, you know, whether they're getting pressure from their family members on marriage, on the aspect of having more children, you know, again, like I stressed academics, so academic wise, how is creativity maybe being not pushed or is that something you really want? And it goes back to, again, that balance and that, like you said, it's kind of that push and pull and you want to keep everyone together still. So. Right, right. Excellent point for sure. And so how are community relationships important for mental health providers? So I think those are extremely important. Like I mentioned, um, in general, most South Asians are going to be more likely to talk about physical somatic symptoms. And so I think it is extremely important to remember that a lot of these patients might first present at the primary care physician office. And so having those relationships out in the community to, you know, identify yourself as someone who um, can work with South Asian individuals and are sensitive to some of these cultural practices um, and just giving information to be like, okay, if you kind of see like there is like clinical depression, there's more going on that, you know, here's, here's a few resources that you can um, use to maybe um, send them over to a clinician who is better equipped to handle more longer term, more severe issues. So do you have some specific resources you can share with us? Yes, for sure. I think um, so, you know, I think it's going to be important to identify and join forces with allies, right? So here I know in Chicagoland, for example, we have an organization. Um, it's called Apna Kar, which means our house in Hindi. And it is an organization that works with uh, individuals who are experiencing gender violence, and they help them uh, hook up with advocacy and connect them with mental health resources. I know we have the website of SouthAsianTherapist.org, and obviously our very own Life Science Health. We have many, many therapists here that identify as South Asian and they speak the different languages. So for sure, that would be um, somewhere to start with at least to get some more information to be like, hey, you know, we're having, I have a patient who presented, you know, what are your thoughts on this? Is there something else I should know about or I should ask them? So definitely try to use some of those resources. My gosh, Dr. Belina, thank you. You were a pleasure to talk to you on this topic and really even made me look at my own clients that I've been working with in, in another light as well, making sure I'm incorporating some of the things you had mentioned too. So thank you very much for your time. Yeah, and for thank you. Thank you for knowledge. having me. I think, you know, just kind of last thoughts too. Yeah. I think always as clinicians, you know, we should be promoting research that respects all diverse backgrounds yes. and making sure that we're using culturally informed practices with working with all of our patients. So I agree. So thank thank you you for having me. You're welcome.